guys, what's up? And welcome back to another BBOD talk. Today, I'm joined by Diego Salazar, also known as Rira, um, to a lot of the community. He is a contributor for Monero um, and very well known within the Monero community. So a lot of people know him as Rira, as I mentioned. So it's great to have you here on the channel today, Diego. Yeah, it's good to be here. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to have you. Okay, so a lot of the questions I'm going to be discussing in this interview today are questions that I reached out to the Reddit community for um, Monero and got a lot of their questions on what they want to ask Diego all about Monero. Um, I got a lot of questions, which was really good, but unfortunately I have had to cut a few of those down. So I'm really sorry if we don't answer your question today. Um, but hopefully, perhaps we'll have Diego back on the channel one day and we can discuss those questions further. So let's get started with our questions. So first of all, just I've just got a question, like a general question from us for the people watching today who don't really know that much about Monero. So Diego, if you could just kind of explain what Monero is and how it works. Sure. So... Um... I guess one of the best ways to say it is that Monero is very similar. Monero is what people think they're buying when they buy Bitcoin. Uh, so that, that's kind of a loaded statement. So I'll kind of unpack that a little bit. Um, most people, when they purchase Bitcoin, they, they have a, an expectation of a certain level of privacy and anonymity. They hear like, you know, that, you know, Bitcoin's using the darknet markets and stuff, you know, so Bitcoin is super private. Um, and it's really not uh, just the way blockchain works. Fundamentally, it is actually very open, transparent and public um, for audibil auditability purposes. Um, and when the people of Monero <clears throat> really, really liked a lot of the things that Bitcoin did. They liked the ideology. They liked the underlying technology. The fundamentals of blockchain are really, really solid. But we see the, the huge transparency of Bitcoin as a flaw. Some people don't, but we see it as a critical flaw, um, primarily because of fungibility, which I don't know if people have heard. They've probably heard that word thrown around, maybe not really know what it means. And fungibility is just this idea that one of something is equal to another of that same something. So as an example, $1 is equal to $1 and they're fairly interchangeable. If you have a dollar and I have a dollar and we exchange dollars, um, right? There's not been a value transfer, even though we have different dollars. But that's not necessarily the same with Bitcoin, where one Bitcoin is equal to Bitcoin, because, you know, if one Bitcoin very recently in its past has gone through a transaction that is provably nefarious, you know, maybe um, it's gone through a known darknet market address or something like that, then it becomes a tainted Bitcoin. And some exchanges will shut down your account pending investigation, some, like, something like Coinbase and stuff, you know, just because they have to for KYC AML purposes. Um and so really that puts a disparity between Bitcoins where ones that are tainted recently, ones that have taint farther back in their history. And it's up to each exchange to say, OK, if in the past five transactions it's gone through something bad, we can't accept it. And it gets really hairy really quickly. Um, and it doesn't work when people like to say, you know, digital cash, digital cash. But it doesn't work like that because I, the five dollars in my pocket, I don't know where it's been, but I don't actually really care where it's been. I can just spend it at any grocery store and they'll accept it, you know, because they also don't know where it's been. And so really that's what Monero is trying to emulate. So when people hear that privacy aspect, they get a little bit uncomfortable. They think, isn't that just kind of for criminals? Um, you know, only criminals need that level of privacy, but it's actually not true. I'm a very squeaky clean guy. You know, I don't shop dark net markets. You know, I, I live a fairly chill life. I got some chickens out in the back. You know, I got a nice little wife and we do some fun little stuff. And, you know, I'm a pretty squeaky clean guy, but actually I need privacy because I, I, I need privacy actually more than um, to, to protect my squeaky clean reputation. Uh, because as an example, if I'm a merchant and I, you know, sell t-shirts or something like that, and I receive Bitcoin from a guy who was using Bitcoin for drug transactions, even though I had nothing to do with those transactions, now I am in possession of that Bitcoin, which means if you know law enforcement is doing blockchain analysis, which gets better every single day, and they say, okay, now... Diego has this Bitcoin, they're going to come knocking on my door. And even though I had nothing to do with this, you know, like now I'm under investigation. They're like, okay, Diego, stay in town while we look through, look through all this stuff and prove. And so this is even going to be, we, we've seen it time and time again, where even if somebody is accused of something, even if they are not 
guilty of it. Many times it taints their reputation in a pretty bad way. Um, so for me to kind of keep that squeaky clean reputation that I have, I really do need privacy to defend me from all the other people out there that are doing things that are um, that society thinks are less than uh, fantastic. So this whole fungibility issue where one equals one is only unlocked when privacy is by default and mandatory. And a lot of um, projects will try to put kind of bolt on privacy. They're like, well, we have optional privacy. You can toggle it on or off if you want. And that also doesn't work because if you, if you follow a coin and you see, okay, it's gone through a public transaction, public, 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 private. Now all of a sudden that stands out and you're like, okay, what, what were you doing there that needed to be private? How come, how come it couldn't just be public? Whereas with Monero, it's all or nothing. Everything is private all the time for everybody. And it, in that way, it really does operate just like cash. Um, some people may look at that and think it's a little bit too powerful of a tool because it can be abused, which is, you know, it's very true. Um, it can be used for, for bad things, but it's also a very powerful tool for freedom. And we look in other countries that are under more totalitarian regimes than maybe we in the first world are used to. And privacy for them means a lot because the inability to hide money or to hide information lead to the loss of their money, the loss of their property, the loss of their freedom, they can be put in jail, or in the worst case scenarios, the loss of their life. So Monero really has this, um, I see it as this compassionate heart where we don't just look at Bitcoin, they like to say that they're money for the world, but they're really not because people don't just need immutability out of um, the ability to transfer value, they also need privacy there. And so, there's these marginalized people that suffer the most from lack of privacy and they're kind of, well, j even just that word marginalized, they're kind of over on the fringes and nobody's really thinking about them. Monero is really the only coin that not only has Bitcoin's immutability, but can also serve these people who actually would not be able to make incredible uh, use of Bitcoin like we think they might. So, um, you know, is there a market for a public blockchain like Bitcoin? Is there a world where Bitcoin and Monero can coexist well and go hand in hand? Well, sure. You know, I think there's always going to be that type of thing. But on the day to day, even as me, a squeaky clean guy, I would prefer to use Monero just so I'm not accidentally caught up in something. And then even as a business owner and a merchant, I don't want to have to see, okay, I can't accept this point, but I, um, Bitcoin, but I can't accept this one. And this one's kind of fishy. So send me another one. I'd rather just, just like with cash, just accept it. That's the end for me, you know, at oh. scale, um, having to go through each of these Bitcoins uh, to check their to check their value is just it's just not going to work maybe if only i have two customers okay that's fine but uh, if i scale up to a hundred thousand customers it becomes pretty nightmarish so with monero you don't have to worry about any of that at all so just on an individual level on a business level you know it just it makes so much sense mm. i guess you know with monero that it's privacy all the way like there's no like you said with Bitcoin like what was you doing at that point when it was private and then it, it's mm. not like but with Monero you just it's privacy from the beginning and like everyone should be able to access should be able to have privacy right. I guess yeah so that that's what I really liked about Monero that you just know that it's there from the beginning um, so moving on to the questions from the reddit community so first of all like beyond privacy what else makes you support and work on Monero? Yeah, and so um, that's that's a great question because, <coughs> excuse me, besides privacy, Monero actually does have a really a lot going on going for it. Um, mm. As an example, uh, we're I'm going to kind of briefly touch on Monero's governance structures or lack thereof and how it functions internally on the day to day. Um, so Monero does not have any formalized leadership. Monero doesn't really have any on-chain governance to speak of, which I think ultimately is a sham anyways, with, for reasons I have no time to get into in this interview, maybe another time. But um, Monero really is just, it's very similar to Bitcoin in that you can't point to Bitcoin. You can see um, people who do a lot in the space and people who you know are more well-known in the space, but there's no leader of Bitcoin. And Monero is actually one of the few projects that is, has been able to um, implement that as well, just as, as a core part of its philosophy and ideals and how it's actually played out on a social level uh, to any degree of success. Most other coins, you know, especially ones that have had an ICO that have any sort of corporation or foundation behind it, that, um, you know, there's either somebody holding the money or somebody calling the shots or some sort of formalized leadership structure in place. Um, really, it, we, we view that as... Uh, 
a, a failure of decentralization, which may not be a huge deal for some, you know, there, there are pros and cons to centralization and decentralization. Um, obviously, when something is more centralized um, in this space, so I guess let me back up. People really don't know what these words mean. They've, they've just kind of become buzzwords and people throw them around and not really know why decentralization is important and really what the costs of decentralization are because it's not all um, rainbows and kittens. You know, with centralization, you have the power to make decisions quickly because you only have to contact maybe one person and you have to get that person's yes or no, kind of like a manager or a boss. Um, so things can get done much faster and you have one guy kind of making sure everybody's on task and somebody that everybody is answering to. Whereas with decentralization, um, things are done much more slowly because it's much harder to, to gauge consensus. When, when you have no formalized leadership, how do you gauge whether everybody's on board with something or not? Um, how do you get, gauge whether, okay, most of the people are on board, so we're going to move forward with this? But if there's no, no formalized leadership, who do, who do we complain to when things don't work out right, right? Like there's a whole bunch of things that we just take for granted in terms of the, the centralized world that we live in just because it's the – the centralized way is the most efficient, um, but decentralization brings an element of safety that you wouldn't otherwise have because let's say that centralized boss or manager is compromised or he has alternative interests, whether they be his own or for somebody else or somebody's paying him, right? Then if you compromise that guy or if you put pressure on that guy, you can really do a lot of damage to the project as a whole. Whereas with decentralization, if you compromise somebody like myself, well, I do a lot in the community, but I don't do everything in the community and nobody answers to me. So you'd be able to do some damage in the areas where I am able to put my little tentacles in, in the Monero community, but not a ton of damage if I was like the boss, the head guy, right? So there's an element of safety that decentralization brings. Um, and Monero is very, very committed to that. Monero has um, <clears throat> a lot of the same ideals and reasons for existence that Bitcoin does. Bitcoin came to exist for a very specific reason. And it's so that way we can take the, the monopoly of making money away from governments. But this has been attempted before in history where people have made their own monies, but they've always been down by the governments you know the government doesn't like that competition and it's usually because there's the centralized source there's a centralized guy who had this idea and he's the one running this business and doing this thing um and at this point you know the government wouldn't be able to shut down bitcoin because there's no single source to put pressure on and the same thing is true of monero um so that actually makes me very excited to work on monero because i'm a um, i'm a very go-getter you know uh, kind of guy where i get stuff done on my own you know and uh, something like monero is great for me because um, I don't have to ask anybody's permission to do something. I can just yeah. jump right in and get something done. And even if it's unpopular in the community, even if people are like, oh, we don't like this. As an example, Monero people are so committed to being <laughs> hipster and weird and stupid that they're like, oh, we don't like marketing because only shit coins market and you don't see the US dollar marketing and stuff. So they're not big fans of marketing yeah. in general, right? Um, by and large, you've got some that are and some that aren't. And every time somebody tries to come in and start something marketing, you get some people that, meh, 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 you know, they, they grumble. <laughs> um, and the cool thing is um, you don't even need the community's permission if you want to start marketing yeah. Monero. You could just pop in and you can start doing it. M yeah. Maybe you won't be popular with some guys. Maybe you will be popular with some other guys, but you can go ahead and do it. And we have had some people that have started doing those kinds of things. And usually they there's a compromise as an example, there's a work group, a group of people that got together, they wanted to do some marketing and they may, ended up doing the outreach work group. They're like, well, we could do marketing through education and outreach and all that kind of stuff. And the community <laughs> liked that verbiage better. So, you know, they, 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 they're okay with that. Um, and they do some fun work and they do some good work. And so really it, Monero is actually very low barrier of entry in terms of if you want to get involved, um, even if you think it's just, you know, a gateway to get to, to get involved in other projects or something, by all means, please come in, come get involved any way you can. Um, there's we we have launched tons of open source resources um, that help people get connected to the places where they want to go. If you want to help translate, if you want to help outreach, you know, if you want to help um, if a lot of people like, well, I don't code. What can I do? But there's actually plenty to do besides coding. So. Monero is a, a very low barrier of entry to get started and to get connected and to, and to keep going. And it's one of the reasons why I actually got into Monero to, to begin with. So I, that's one of the big reasons I, I, I stick around and I really like Monero besides for the whole privacy aspect. It's very decentralized. It, it has its ideals and it doesn't compromise on them. 
Um, it doesn't compromise on the original Bitcoin ideals. In fact, it takes them further. Um, and that's not to say there's not value in other projects that have compromised in some ways on those things, because ultimately all of this is one big experiment anyways. And it's better to have a whole bunch of simultaneously running, but slightly different experiments than everybody running the same experiment. Because when most of the projects die, and most of them will, then we can do <laughs> autopsies on all the ones that have died and see why didn't they work? Was it a decentralization error? Was it, you know, was it because it was too centralized? Was it the flaws in the code, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway. Okay, <laughs> that was a very good um, answer anyway. Um, so can you now describe your stance within the ASICs debate? Yeah, so once again, <clears throat> most people, the whole ASICs debate really at its core is a decentralization debate. Um, so, and, and we, we kind of touched upon de uh, on decentralization in the previous question, but I, I stated there before, and I'm gonna reiterate it again, most people don't understand why ASICs could be good or could be bad. Uh, they just adhere, they, they listen to something, they hear something, and they, they adhere to um, what they've been told or what they believe, ASICs good or ASICs bad. And that's really all they have. And when you ask them, well, why? Maybe they might have a, a few things, a few talking points or bullet points that they've heard before. You know, well, because of decentralization or because we, this, that, the other thing. Okay. Um, it gets more complicated than that, and it's definitely much more nuanced the, the further you dig into it. And it's this idea that there is decentralization in mining. And the more people are mining on their own computers, the more separate entities, the more self-interested entities are mining, uh, the more secure the network is. Because now in order to collude with people, like let's say there's, let's say for example, there's only two miners on the network, right? If you want to attack the network, you only have to get these two guys to, to work with you and you've compromised the whole thing. Uh, maybe you only have to get one of these guys, maybe he's a bigger player than the other, to work with you. And all of a sudden, you've got 51% of the vote or more, right? Now, if there's three guys, well, now you have to expend some more resources to get either all three or two out of the three. And if there's four, if there's 10, if there's 20, as the number increases, the number of people that you have to get to agree to your collusion, it, it's much harder for you from a from an... Um, uh, the, the word escapes me at the moment, but from a communication perspective, getting everybody to work together from a monetary perspective, maybe some of them are going to want money to, to be paid off in order to work with you. Right. So as, as the number of people increases, as the number of miners increases, self-interested miners, because um, if I run two miners, well, then both of them are run by me. So getting both of those to work for me is, is not difficult. So as the number of self-interested miners increases, the network gets harder and harder to attack. Um, assuming that everybody has the same hash rate. And once again, it gets nuanced and I'm not going to get into that necessarily. So we're going to leave it at that kind of high overview. Um, so this idea of ASICs is that um, the original idea was that every computer would be able to produce hashes. Every computer would be able to competitively mine for Bitcoin and secure the network and well, competitively mine and secure the network and be reimbursed for their work by newly minted Bitcoins or newly minted coins, whatever they might, might be. But ASICs are the very, very specialized computers that can only do one thing and, and do it extremely well. And that is mine. That's all they can do. You can't use it for word processing. You can't use it for watching videos. All they can do is mine, right? But they do it so much better than regular computers that are much more versatile. So the computer that you're on or I'm on right now, it can mine Bitcoin inefficiently. Um, but it can also do a bunch of other things. And so there's that trade-off there where you can do one thing super, super well or be a jack of all trades, but you do nothing in particularly well. So what this means is that one ASIC, because it's so efficient at what it does, can equal thousands, if not tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of regular computers, right? So now even if I have 100,000 self-interested miners, but one guy running an ASIC, that one guy cancels out all of these self-interested miners. So it's the equivalent of having only two miners of, on the network because all these 100,000 self-interested ones equal one big conglomerate. And then there's me with the one ASIC, right? Okay. So it, it basically brings it down to like two, the, the network down to two miners. And so this, wow. this idea, you know, we hear China all the time and how they have the bit main and how they have all these ASICs and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> To answer your question, where do I stand on this debate, <laughs> right? I'm, I'm, I'm giving everybody who's watching kind of a rundown on ASICs as a whole and decentralization as a whole. <laughs> but to answer your question, um, 
I generally think that ASICs do more damage than good at this point in time because they're so hard to make and so hard to get a hold of that only very resource wealthy people are able to create them or get a hold of them, right? Mm -hmm. You're not going to see people in third world countries have the money to spend to get ASICs. It's going to be a massive investment for them if they are going to like they're going to have to save all of their money to try to get one of these things in the hopes of um, mining Bitcoin competitively. And there's also these things like if uh, if a person makes an ASIC and I make it better than the previous version, I might keep that version to myself for a while before I sell it. So I get an advantage, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, If there is any point where ASICs become commonplace everywhere, just like computers are commonplace everywhere. Right. Mm -hmm. Then. It may not be as bad as it is now. I may be, you know, like I could be persuaded that, you know, okay, ASICs are okay because you have an ASIC. I have an ASIC. We've all got built-in ASICs in our phones and our computers on our whatever. So everybody is still able to be competitive. And that's the, that's the whole point of ASICs. Um, not ASICs. That's the whole point of the mining. We need self-interested parties that are able to competitively, uh, that are able to compete with each other in that whole mining process. And right now ASICs reduces that competition to a select few. If there is a point where ASICs become commonplace, then that competition becomes widespread again. So it's not necessarily that big of a deal. Um, The other thing I I don't really care for about ASICs is that like, let's say I'm trying to transfer ASICs to another country. I'm trying to ship them. ASICs are very easily identifiable. Mm -hmm. And so if a government is like, no, we're not going to allow cryptocurrencies, um, for any reason, they, they're like that. Then if ASICs are coming in, they're like, no, we see these are ASICs. These are these, the only purpose of these is mining cryptocurrencies. We're going to we're not going to accept these. We're going to push these away. So now these people don't have an opportunity to competitively mine. And so the, the, the currencies, the cryptocurrencies in that place are going to be greatly hindered, whereas you can't stop the shipment of computers in a place. I mean, you can at the cost at great cost of you know the technology of your entire com- country, but um, if there is algorithms that are better designed for kind of whole for any r- random computer to be able to hash competitively, then the whole world of cryptocurrency opens up to anyone and everyone in that country who has a computer. Um, so that that's just something that's not talked about as often, but mm-hmm. that's uh, yeah. Next question. <laughs> Okay. I think it'd be great though for people who are about your stance within it. They'll now have a better understanding of that. So that's really good. Um, so what in your estimation is the greatest weakness or hurdle that's facing Monero in order for it to gain more adoption? So open source as a whole has really bad user experience. Cryptocurrency compounds on that by also having bad user experience. But now, instead of just having a a photo editing program that has bad user experience, it's my money. And if I mess up, I can lose my money, Mm -hmm. right? So that's bigger. Monero, because it layers privacy technologies on top of Bitcoin and stuff like that, it it adds layers of complexity. Um, And those need to be navigated and we're in the midst of learning how people use Monero and we're, we're always asking questions and trying of different designs and stuff because Monero is actually considerably more complicated than Bitcoin in some respects. In some respects, it's easier than Bitcoin, right? So like with Bitcoin, in order to stay private, they say you should only use each address one time, that kind of thing. Whereas with Monero, you can use the same address all the time just because of the privacy. So you don't have to keep track of all these different addresses. Mm-hmm. Um, so <clears throat> Monero is... Uh, It's actually better in that sense for some people, but, you know, uh, normal things of key management and some of the additional privacy complexities and trying to stay private, staying private is really, really hard. Okay. Privacy is really, really hard. Like there is no silver bullet for privacy. Like if you use Tor, you're good. If you use I2P, you're good. If you use Monero, you're good. There's none of that. Privacy is extraordinarily difficult and keeping your privacy is really, really freaking hard. Okay, so there's a lot of consider. There's there's ways to use Monero incorrectly there that can um, harm your privacy in the process. Um, there's ways to there's ways to use Bitcoin incorrectly that can harm your privacy. And so Monero kind of has a bigger leeway in that if you if you do use it incorrectly, you're still more private than Bitcoin regularly, and definitely more private than if you use Bitcoin incorrectly. Um, But the user experience is being worked on and it's a huge, huge hurdle. Um, And as a whole, 
open source software is not very fantastic at user experience, like I said, um, because it's usually a lot of coders, a lot of developers who are not UX people. I, I myself am a UI UX guy. Um, I own a small design firm and um, so that's why this issue is very close to my heart, right? Mm. And, and I, I see what I can do and I do whatever I can and we make designs and stuff to see how we can improve Monero. Um, but uh, developers are generally not UX people. They don't have user experience training and a lot of them think uh, for themselves because they're making stuff for themselves. You know, what would I use? Which is great, that's totally fine. At least you got one, at least one user in the world who would use your software and that's you. But when we're designing for other people, there's there's a certain amount of empathy that needs to exist. There's a certain amount of understanding and testing. And, and it's actually very scientific. People think that user experience and user interface is subjective. Like, what color should we paint the walls? You know, like, that's, that's subjective. But user experience is not subjective. User experience is this idea that if I change a color from blue to green, and it helps my users accomplish their goals faster and with less confusion, then it is an objectively better design. And I should move from blue to green. Right. right? So right. everything from color to location of buttons to the way that things are explained to right. icons, all of these things add cognitive load. All of these things are something that can either add confusion or help a user achieve something faster. And so really yeah. that's like, there's there's very scientific testing approach to this A-B testing where like, okay, now this color is blue for some people. Now this color is green for yeah. some people, which ones do it better? And then you go with that one. And it's really, it's, this, this gets pretty expensive yeah. for even regular companies to run, right? Much less something like Monero, which doesn't have a formalized leadership structure, didn't take a pre-mine, didn't take an ICO. So there's no money for this kind of thing, yeah. right? Um, so that, that's that's the other issue is that UX is an issue and we don't really have a huge amount of resources to tackle it. it we, mm. we rely on volunteers and experts thinking, oh, this is a cool project. I want to get involved in it, right? And if there's yeah. not those, if there's not that amount of experts, and that, that's one of the benefits of having the ICOs. And stuff but we do all. have people, interested people like myself. There's a guy called Nuffelbund. That's a pseudonym. I don't think that's his real name. But um <laughs> And we are UX people, and so we do kind of uh, see what we can do to improve that in Monero, and it is it is fun. Um, yeah. So not having a ton of resources is also I, I lightly touched on that in the UX issue. It, mm. it it is a big issue for Monero, and it is one thing that we struggle with because we can't just hire the best of the best and get all these people to come in and start working on Monero. Really, um, it's idealists, the people that believe in the mission, that come to work on Monero, and so mm. that does have some pros in that the, the culture of Monero is considerably more pure than other cryptocurrencies. And, and I guess when I say that, I mean that you, you do have some people talking about price, but by and large, you have a lot of people that are trying to change the world more than get rich. Mm. And 99% of the cryptocurrency space is trying to get rich. But <laughs> literally everybody is trying yeah. to do that, right? Um, and so obviously Monero people, if Monero goes up, they're not complaining like, oh my gosh, no, we're getting more money, uh, right? But they're not complaining, but that's not the primary goal. The primary goal is to put fungible, digital, private money in the hands of the people who need it most. And because yeah. we don't have the money to throw around to pay just anyone, the people who get involved are the people who believe in that mission. Mm. So it's so, great that you have those people that are so passionate about being involved, I guess. Right. And then people yeah. come into our community and they consistently tell us, you know, you guys have such a high caliber of intelligent, passionate mm -hmm. people working on your project. And a lot yeah. of people have stuck with us, even, you know, even traders and stuff. They like, I used to be in it for the money and I kind of still am. I, it's like the, all the shit coins and Monero. And I kind of, yeah. I'm invested in the success of Monero, right? Yeah. Uh, for different reasons. So mm -hmm. the, the, you know, rewinding back just a little bit to the question, the, the lack of resources is a problem. We do have ways. To